Good morning, everyone. You are joining the Philippine Stars webinar on renewable energy the day we go zero with the Energy Development Corporation or EDC. I'm Dani Laurel and I will be your moderator for today. The heat is on, but it's not in a good way, no thanks to human activity. The United Nations' Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, a group of scientists whose findings are endorsed by the world's governments, has confirmed this inconvenient truth in its recently released report. Now, the progress that mankind has made over the years has warmed our planet. And while efforts have been weighed to curb the effects of climate change, they are not nearly enough considering that our planet is on the brink of permanent damage. We all need to do something to limit global temperature to 1.5 degrees by 2050. But the question is, what should we do and are we ready for those changes? In answer to this, Zero Emissions Day was first conceptualized in Canada that was calling for a movement to reduce the amount of fossil fuels consumed in one day. Years later, it is now observed in many other countries in the world. The question now is how can Zero Emissions Day be contextualized in the Philippine environment and is that even possible? Now today our esteemed panelists are here to discuss the true state of our climate crisis and what companies are doing to be a part of the solution to this problem that we and the generations before us have created. Our first speaker of the day is Secretary Emmanuel M. de Guzman. Sec Emmanuel de Guzman is an international expert on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, having spent the past 30 years of his career working in the public sector and civil society organizations. He formerly served as Deputy Administrator at the Office of Civil Defense National Disaster Coordinating Council Secretary. Now, from 2007 to 2015, he served as Senior Advisor on Disaster Risk Reduction at the World Meteorological Organization and the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction over in Geneva, Switzerland, promoting high-level advocacy and multi-stakeholder partnership on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation at all levels. Sekne Guzman has prepared a short presentation for us today discussing international and local solutions to the environmental problem. To the organizers of this webinar, the Philippine Star Energy Development Corporation, leaders of the private business sector and civil society, fellow workers in government, ladies and gentlemen, good day. All of us here recognize the dangers that humanity faces. As the world warms, so do the threats to our very survival prevail. Sea levels are rising threatening to engulf communities along coasts, coral reefs and their marine inhabitants are edging closer to extinction due to ocean acidification, not to mention pollution. Extreme weather events are visiting us more frequently and with greater intensity. If humanity maintains the current trajectory of carbon emissions, a three-degree global warming is foreseen by the end of this century. Following the launch of the latest landmark report on climate change, the physical science basis, the first of three reports for the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the science has become even clearer, with the numbers speaking in even starker terms. AR6 Working Group 1 report is both a fever dream and a clarion call we are looking at a picture of doom. Extreme heat, heavy rainfall, drought, far weather, and warming and rising sea levels that will imperil hundreds of millions of people in our lifetime and in the 21st century. This latest IPCC report provides a grimmer scenario than the previous ones, but it also emphasizes Something can still be done, but it needs to be done now. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the global goal, is still doable, but only through immediate and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. On top of this, 
As a country that is in the line of fire of climate change, our responsibilities run deeper. The storms and the droughts come with the responsibility to ensure that our communities will be able to weather our vulnerabilities. We are all called to action, to think not only of how to survive, but to act with foresight and urgency in breaking the constant climate cycle of destructions and rehabilitation. In the global effort to address the climate and environmental issues, numerous international instruments have already been passed. Among them, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification. In 2015, the Community of Nations adopted three important international frameworks, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, aimed at saving people and planet from imminent destruction. Numerous laws have also been introduced, not just to ensure accountability for environmental issues, but also to provide impetus for the climate agenda to be mainstreamed into development planning and policy making. The presence of these international agreements and local laws, however, does not automatically guarantee results. Our success, our very survival, depends on our urgency, on our intensity, and on how we harmonize and harness our collective energy towards the collective goal. The challenge is not just for our government, but also for our private sector leaders to prepare this early on. Business as usual will not do. We all, as united human race, must aim higher and dream bigger and exercise radical ambition in pursuing climate action. First, we must reform energy policies to wean us from unsustainable and unhealthy fossil energy use. We must do this quickly and pour resources towards more sustainable energy sources. This is not only the more compassionate and more conscientious approach, it is also becoming the smarter, more profitable, sustainable approach. Second, business plans must be harmonized and aligned with the larger economy-wide climate agenda embodied by our nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. We have conveyed our target of 75% reduction and avoidance of carbon emissions in our first NDC for the period 2020 to 2030. While much of this is contingent on the support of the developed countries, in terms of climate finance, technology transfer, and capacity building in the context of climate justice, we must show the world that we are doing what we can, which is all that we can, across all sectors of our society. Third, we ensure climate-friendly land use. The agricultural sector, in particular, must pursue climate-smart and disaster-resilient approaches that ensure the resilience of rural livelihood and promote climate change adaptation and mitigation in food production. Fourth, people at risk must be given a sense of security given the impending intensification of climate change impacts. This entails promoting and providing them with insurance coverage and the insurance industry should develop more innovative risk financing and insurance solutions to build resilient and sustainable communities. The Earth is now 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than it was at the start of the Industrial Revolution. Net zero emission by mid-century is the only way to go. Many years from now, People across the globe will look back to the generation of today. They will look back whether we acted with decisiveness or doubt, with urgency or unconcern. Through our collective resolve for climate action to go for zero carbon emissions, I am hopeful that they will find these years as the defining time so many came together to save humanity in our common home. Thank you to all of you, and I look forward to the success of this webinar.
Thank you so much for that. Now, up next, ladies and gentlemen, we have a world-renowned environmental advocate here with us to share her experiences and advocacies. Deputy Speaker Legarda is well known for her environmental advocacies, and she is here today to share her breadth of knowledge and insight on the solutions and strategies being done to combat climate change. A former journalist, Legarda is a three-term senator, environmentalist, and cultural worker. In 2001, she was declared as a UNEP laureate by the United Nations Environmental Program and in 2008, the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction declared her regional champion for disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation for Asia and the Pacific. She currently serves as the representative of Antique and as House Deputy Speaker. And now, without further ado, let's all please give a warm hand to Deputy Speaker Legarda. It is with great pleasure that I take part in this gathering to share with you how other alternative sources of energy are making waves in the industry, how the Philippine government is positioned amidst current environmental issues, and how renewable energy can save the future. Climate change is perhaps the greatest challenge that humanity is facing in this era. Together with a state of massive plastic pollution, the magnitude of environmental degradation, and the crippling COVID-19 pandemic, we need to acknowledge the hard truth. We humans have cost all of this. And despite the vast, limitless sources of renewable energy above the ground, we are continuously digging up fossil fuels buried deep in the ground. Our unsystematic management of plastic waste is choking the life in our oceans. We are denuding our forests for short-term gain, converting our mountains and lands and forcing animals away from their habitats in the name of development. After years, decades, centuries of finding ways to make use of the Earth's resources for the convenience of humanity, we did not realize that we have also made the Earth a convenient place to die of hunger, pollution, disasters, pandemics, all because of unsustainable practices, all because of the mindset that we can use and abuse the resources of this planet at the expense of the present and future generations. Humans have been given the vital role as stewards of the earth, but we all know that in order to keep our planet healthy, livable, and sustainable, we need to change our values, beliefs, our ways of living to do what is right and good for the environment. Otherwise, our children and the future generations will be left with nothing. As a lawmaker since 1998, over two decades, I've authored, sponsored many laws that champion environmental protection and climate action, as well as protection of the welfare of every Filipino. We were able to legislate in my first term, Clean Air Act, my favorite RA9003 Ecological Solid Waste Management Law, Clean Water Act still in my first term, Renewable Energy Law in my second term, Climate Change Act in my second term, this created Climate Change Commission, and the amendatory law, again, in my second term, People's Survival Fund, which is actually our local adaptation fund. We also enacted the Environmental Education and Awareness Act, the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction Management Law in 2010, and in my last term, the expanded National Integrated Protected Area System, which legislated the protection and preservation of over 94 important ecosystems, including our open seas, our coastal areas, our wetlands, our tropical forests, critical, all of them in our climate adaptation and biodiversity conservation mechanisms, bringing to 107 all our protected areas. The challenge really is, has always been in the effective implementation of these laws. 
Our work is to exercise strong oversight function to ensure that the executive agencies efficiently implement the laws we author. Our work is to ensure that our people actually understand and know that the laws exist, that they are utilized and that they benefit from them and that the laws we enact make full use of their everyday knowledge, especially indigenous traditional knowledge, because like I always say, all climate action is local. We succeed or we fail, depending on how well we do at the level of the local communities, which are at the forefront of the climate crisis and disasters, which are also in the forefront of the pandemic. That is why we need to boost assistance provided to local entrepreneurs, our rural communities in the grassroots as part of poverty alleviation and to promote domestic economic growth. Micro, small and medium enterprises, my law in my second term, they have the greatest potential to be the main driver of our economic development. Given sufficient attention and support, this sector will no doubt accelerate social economic empowerment of various sectors in society, including women, youth, and our indigenous people's communities. To support the growth of MSMEs, we need a plan that includes reducing climate risks, building resilience and adaptation, alleviating the adverse effects of climate change means switching to clean, affordable, accessible, renewable energy. And what drives economic growth and yet some of the areas in the country have limited access to electricity or none at all. Inclusive growth begins with making basic services available to all, including those in the remotest communities, fostering the participation of micro, small and medium enterprises in the national and global markets will not happen unless renewable energy access is guaranteed to everyone. We are a country rich in renewable energy sources with potential sun, wind, more than enough power our entire country many times over. We must take greater steps to harness this abundance to ensure our sustainable near future. Way back in 2008, I co-authored the Renewable Energy Act to offer a wide range of incentives to spur growth within the RE sector. It is said that we have one of the best RE laws in the world and we adopted it long before other countries adopted their own. In 2019, we passed the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Law, which I also co-authored. And since then, we have installed capacity increase with hundreds of megawatts of solar and wind in excess of even the DOE's targets back then. But we are still far away from maximizing our potential. The most intriguing aspect of RE law implementation in our country is arguably the absence of a clear and strong political commitment to develop and stimulate a healthy market for renewable energy development. I therefore call on all our fellow leaders to integrate mainstream renewables in the country's power system because it is what we need today, now. Not only as a symbolic gesture of support to climate action, but also from an economic viewpoint. The Philippines is one of the least responsible for causing climate change, but we are the most vulnerable to its adverse impacts. We should be more mindful, respectful, of all environmental laws, veering away from a consumptive lifestyle, working towards building resilience. We must ensure that our efforts to pursue recovery from the pandemic reflect the shift in both mindset, values, lifestyle. And they must be attuned to the policies and the laws on climate change adaptation, even mitigation that they recognize that the only way for a sustainable recovery is a climate pathway. This has been Lore de Garda, Isang Lunti ang Pilipinas. 
sa ating lahat. Maraming salamat, Deputy Speaker Legarda, for that wonderful insight and message. And now here with us today to give us a closer insight on how to decarbonize the business sector is Richard B. Tantoko from EDC. Tantoko is currently President and Chief Operating Officer of EDC and several EDC subsidiaries. He is also the President and Trustee of the Oscar M. Lopez Center for Climate Change Adaptation and Disaster Risk Management Foundation, Incorporated. He has been a Director of the International Geothermal Association since 2010. Today, Mr. Tantoko will talk about the feasibility of businesses helping the country reduce our emissions. How can private businesses help the country decarbonize and meet our target? Mr. Tantoko, you now have the virtual floor. To the Honorable uh, Lauren Legarda, good morning to Secretary Manny de Guzman and uh, his representative. To our fellow environmental advocates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you also to the Philippine Star for putting together this forum where we can discuss how we can all work together to the, and respond to the United Nations climate warning. Let me just introduce our company. EDC, our company, works to help decarbonize the Philippines with almost 1,500 of pure renewable energy in its portfolio. 1,181 megawatts of which is base load geothermal. We know after being constantly hit by strong typhoons, the worst of which was Super Typhoon Yolanda, which ravaged our biggest geothermal facility located in Leyte, that climate change now poses the biggest risk, not only to our business, but to our communities and to our country as well. So while we in the Lopez Group have already committed as early as 2016, to not invest in coal and to focus on generating electricity from renewable energy sources. We try to set the bar by committing to forge collaborative pathways for a decarbonized and regenerative future at the height of the pandemic last year. This mission calls for us to go beyond just incremental sustainability by looking at our business as more than just profit engines as we elevate everything we touch, be it the environment, our co-creators that include our employees, our contractors, our communities, our customers, and our investors. I know that our esteemed experts, Congresswoman Legarda and Secretary de Guzman have already talked about the IPCC's latest assessment report, but let me just show you a brief summary slide to emphasize what the United Nations press statement describes us, and I quote, widespread, rapid, and intensifying in reference to the true state of our changing climate. The changes are found in every continent and are unprecedented over hundreds of thousands of years, with some of them already irreversible. And these are as follows. Number one, it is unequivocal that human activities have warmed the oceans, land, and atmosphere, resulting in weather extremes across the globe. Number two, the scale of the recent changes across the climate system as a whole are unprecedented over thousands of years. And third, without dramatic reductions of greenhouse gases, climate change and weather extremes will accelerate and intensify. So we all need to ask the question, is there hope for humanity and our planet? And my answer to that is yes, a resounding yes there is, but we need to move decisively and we need to move fast. As the IPCC report said, and I quote, we are on code red for humanity. We are working within a very, very narrow window, so we all need to act forcefully and decisively now. There are three major strategies that companies can implement to be part of the solution and at the same time to future-proof your business. And these are, number one, stop supporting or buying from coal. It is the single largest source of global warming. Second, be an enabler for decarbonization. And third, work to make your business carbon neutral. 
Let me talk about each of them briefly. In terms of stopping to support coal, which is the single largest source of global warming, the World Resources Institute or WRI recommends that countries phase out coal in electricity generation five years faster. To do this, institutions and businesses need to put their foot down and say, no more coal. The good news is that more nations and institutions and companies around the world have already made this bold declaration. In May 2021, the G7, composed of the world's seven largest advanced economies, agreed to stop funding coal projects that emit carbon by the end of this year and to phase out support for all fossil fuels to meet globally agreed climate change targets. IFC, ADB, Alliance Global Investors, the Export Credit Agency, Japan Bank for International Cooperation, and over 100 significant financial institutions globally have already committed to exit coal as of 2020. More global banks, insurers, pension funds, asset managers are expected to have new or expanded coal exit policies as demands rise and the world continues to heat up. Without funding, coal companies will then have no choice but to transition to renewable energy if they want to stay in business. In order to help them, just transition funds are already on the drawing board to buy out the coal plant and shut them down much sooner than the planned investment horizon of 30 years. Closer to home here in the Philippines, our Department of Energy put a moratorium on new coal projects last September 2020 to emphasize its commitment to decarbonize our country. As Congresswoman Lauren Legarda has said, laws and key policies are already in place to pave the way for businesses to work towards decarbonization. The second thing that businesses can do is to be an enabler of decarbonization. Digital technology is the key to decarbonizing various industries. For instance, we realized that having Zoom meetings, which has inadvertently become a huge part of our daily work since the pandemic last year, will help us travel less once this health crisis ends. An hour of video conferencing emits between 150 and one kilogram of CO2. By comparison, a car emits about nine kilos from burning a gallon of gasoline, which maybe just one commuter will use to get to work. When EDC began utilizing our video conferencing facilities in 2018, our employees reduced air and land travels resulted in a decent reduction in our own scope three emissions. Apart from technologies, green financing is one of the biggest enablers in decarbonizing our global economy. This year, six of the world's top lenders banded together through a collective climate-aligned finance agreement to decarbonize the steel sector, which produces about 1.8 tons of CO2 for every ton of steel. Just two months ago, the first tranche be issued out of EDC's 15 billion worth of ASEAN green bonds was 10 times oversubscribed. This was the result of strong demand from investors who wanted to support and participate in financing the expansion of our 100% clean energy portfolio, which is crucial to decarbonizing our economy as we begin to restart it. The growing level of interest from investors in green projects globally and even here in our country that have been releasing green products like social ESG and sustainability bonds, loans and green index products are paving the way for companies to likewise make the bold commitment to stand for the environment and to work towards carbon neutrality. The third thing a business can do is work towards making your business carbon neutral. One of the key strategies in driving down your company's carbon emissions is to shift to renewable energy. Fortunately, qualified businesses can now get power directly from renewable energy 
through licensed providers under the government's Green Energy Option Program. This scheme empowers consumers with the option to choose affordable, clean, and environment-friendly renewable energy for their source of electricity. After this virtual conference, the first thing you'll need to do is to check if your business is already qualified to become a GEOP customer by visiting our website. Generating power from 100% renewable energy sources and taking care of 270,000 hectares of forests in our geothermal reservations put together have made our operations carbon negative. As we work to maintain this status, we know that we can't save the planet all on our own. For this reason, we would like to fulfill our mission by partnering with other stakeholders to take concrete steps towards becoming carbon neutral, by forming a community where we can empower each other to be part of each other's journey we create ripples of positive impact through pockets of excellence that collectively help our planet heal. While achieving carbon neutrality is just a transition since the end goal should be to have net zero emissions by 2050, we should never fail to honor anyone who makes a firm commitment to be part of the solution instead of contributing to our climate crisis, particularly if such commitment is followed through with resolute action. So today, allow me to name these companies that have committed to walk down the same path to carbon neutrality with EDC, not only because it is good for their business, but because it is also the right thing to do. I will call them in alphabetical order since they are all equally important companies. They are the following, analog devices, Arthaland, Coca-Cola, Drink Communications, First Balfour, Knowles Electronics, Silliman University, and Unilever. We are the Net Zero Carbon Alliance, and together, we as leaders in our respective industries commit to take climate action now. Today, we will sign our Pledge of Commitment not only to the Alliance, but to all our stakeholders and for the good of our common home. May this moment give you hope and move your companies into making your own commitment to help change our climate. Join us in the Net Zero Carbon Alliance. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you so much, Mr. Tantoko, for giving all of us a better idea on what exactly companies can do to future-proof their businesses and, of course, help solve our climate crisis. Now, let us all welcome our guests who are here to sign their pledge of commitment to the Net Zero Carbon Alliance with EDC. We have with us Joseph Emmanuel Liwag. He is the VP and Managing Director of Knowles Philippines. Hello, sir. Next up, Hello. we have... Harris Guevara, the CEO of Drink Communications. Good morning, Hi. Sir Harris. Good morning. Also here with us today is the Vice President for Development of Suleiman University, Ms. Jane Annette L. Bellarmino. Good morning, Ms. Jane. We also have Christina Samantha Pobre. She is the Sustainability Manager of Arthaland. Next up, from First Balfour, we have with us Carlos Pedro C. Salonga, who is, of course, the SVP Head of HR and Ad. Good morning. Good morning. And last but not least, joining us today, we have Ed Sunico, who is, of course, Unilever's Vice President of Communications in Southeast Asia. Good morning. And finally, to represent, of course, EDC as founder of the Net Zero Carbon Alliance, let's bring in Mr. Richard B. Tantoko. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, guys, I believe that each partner here has already had a copy of their Pledge of Commitment. Can you show them to the audience through your cameras, please? Just hold up those pledges. 
there you have it guys we will be showing the specific uh text of that shortly but i just would like to request all of you to kindly sign your respective copies right now and for the sake of the audience please make your signatures big enough so that they can see them on your video screens and of course while you are affixing your signatures please allow me to read the net zero carbon alliance pledge of commitment it reads we recognize that we must act now to limit the global temperature to 1.5 degrees celsius and reverse climate change's catastrophic effects Hence, we, the members of the Net Zero Carbon Alliance, commit to take immediate action towards achieving carbon neutrality. As a Net Zero Carbon Alliance member, we choose to be part of the climate solution by transforming our environmental impact into positive contributions. As thought leaders in our respective industries, we agree to collaborate and share best practices within the Alliance and with other like-minded organizations. Together, we will work towards a carbon neutral Philippines. Truly inspiring guys and dear Net Zero Carbon Alliance partners, do show us your signed copies by flashing them on the screen right now. Let's hold them up for about five seconds so everyone can see them. There you go. I like that large signature. <laughs> I like this e uh, digital signatures, huh? <laughs> Very forward. Thank you so much. And congratulations. Dear members of the audiences, of course, give a virtual clap and congratulate EPC's Net Zero Carbon Alliance and its pioneer founding members. Not just that, a native Vinny tree on behalf of each partner to formally welcome you to the Alliance. All right. These trees are uploaded to EDC's Vinny's community tree project that's an online platform which will allow tree planters to check on the trees they planted and eventually the corresponding carbon sequestered so do stay with us for the panel discussion i'm sure our audience already has a lot of questions in store particularly for mr tantoko but also for our net zero carbon alliance partners and here to join them we have another person with us today is the first philippine holdings chief sustainability officer miss agnes de jesus Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Agnes. She was selected by an international panel to be part of Asia's Top Sustainability Superwomen Honor List that was in 2018 for her comprehensive knowledge and extensive ground experience of more than 20 years that covers environmental, social impact, and governance dimensions of energy operations. And this weekend, she was named one of the Modern Governance 100 awardees by diligent compliance from hundreds of outstanding compliance risk and IT professionals. Congratulations, ma'am, and welcome this morning. And finally, guys, we have also SGV, an advocate of the Net Zero Carbon Alliance. This is, of course, represented by Mr. Benjamin Villacorte, SGV Partner, Climate Change and Sustainability Services. So good morning, Sir Benj, and welcome to the stream. Morning. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's open the floor for a panel discussion with our esteemed guests. You will also have the opportunity to throw in your questions later on. And of course, you know, just uh, to highlight what we want to achieve in the next few minutes, the question in the back of our minds is, have you ever wondered what would happen if we had zero carbon emissions in a day? What would that mean for the Philippines? Is this a pipe dream? Is this a reality that might be happening? Uh, what's the situation here? But before we kick off with, with what that means for the country, I just want to uh, throw this question to Sir Ricky. What made EDC decide to form this Net Zero Carbon Alliance? Why now? Uh, you know, is this something that you've been planning for quite a while? Uh, is this, of course, you know, the urgency of this has been there for a long time. But why finally kick this off today? Yeah. Danny, it's really an attempt to create a broad coalition of collaborators. We've been walking down the sustainability path for about 13 years. But the, the cry of our planet and the cry of humanity is that more and more uh, entities, institutions need to get in and become part of the solution. And as our chairman said, it's no use if we make it to the finish line alone. We need to bring others with us. And I'm very happy that um, those who are here today, you know, um, Unilever, Knowles, Drink, uh, First Balfour, Arthur Land, Siliman University, 
they're very like-minded and they want to be part of the solution uh, going forward. Thank you for that. And of course, we have our founding members with us here. And I just want to go through our around with the same question. What made you decide to join uh, the Alliance? Was it a lot of deliberation? Uh, was it, is it part of your company culture um, that you've been waiting for something like this to come into the foray and finally you signed? Or was it you know something contentious within your company that you, you needed to convince them to, to actually join it? Especially since this is not just any commitment, it's quite a big commitment that will significantly affect the way that your businesses are run. Let's, let's do a round here and kick off with Sir Joseph of Knowles. <clears throat> Thanks, Danny. Uh, first of all, as a corporation, Knowles is committed to conduct our business in an ethical, socially responsible, and environmentally sustainable manner. And this commitment is consistent with our corporate objectives and is essential for our continued business success. In the Philippines, EDC has been our partner since we started our business in Cebu in providing 100% renewable energy. So as we move forward towards you know, climate neutrality, we realized that partnering with organizations who share the same commitment for the environment will help enable us to collaborate and accelerate our efforts towards a sustainable future. Thank you, Sir Joseph. Sir Harris, is it the same for you? Uh, it's part of your culture. It's part of your commitment. Uh, is this, uh, yes. Did it take a lot of convincing uh, to get top management on board? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question, Danny. You know, so technically, well, joining this alliance is really a big commitment, no? but it's a, it's a necessary step to take for us in our organization because uh, we are a sustainability comms agency. So we, uh, we, we work with different clients, convincing them to uh, commit to sustainability. So, so we really have to walk the talk in that case. No? Uh, and uh, we can, so that we can inspire more clients and more partners to do the same. And hopefully, uh, they commit also to the net zero carbon agenda. So I'd, I'd also like to, uh, to, to speak for small businesses. Because thank you very much for inviting Drake. Uh, to, to the to the alliance because we're a small uh, we're a small business and uh, but we already feel the pressure for uh, for small businesses because so because we work with uh, we are suppliers technically of uh, bigger corporations and bigger businesses and uh, as 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 uh, speaker Lagarda mentioned earlier policies policies will change at a rapid pace and hopefully it does here in the Philippines and it, it will uh, definitely reach. Uh, small businesses like us anytime soon so we so we better be prepared so that's why we uh, we, we joined the alliance yeah. very important so i think there's representation as i see here from from every sector as well next we've got miss jane you seem to be in, in my understanding the only representative from an academic institution you know what made you sign this what can the academe uh, really yeah. contribute here well, um, environmental sustainability has always been part of the university's vision, mission, and goals. And the university wants to be a model to a sustainable campus, demonstrating the principles of energy conservation, renewable energy utilization, a reduced carbon footprint, among others. And it is this commitment to the environment that is the basis of the university's participation and wanting to collaborate with EDC on this very noble project. Thank you, ma'am. I hope we see more of those campuses, not just in Siliman, but all over the Philippines. Miss Sam of Arthaland, you know, a uh, development company, a real estate company, this is a big commitment for these types of companies, I think, together with First Balfour as well. You know, you're going to be changing dramatically how you do business. Uh, how committed are you to do this? Yes, it is a very big commitment for uh, real estate developers like us. But you know, for Arthurland, net zero agenda is very close to our heart. Um, you see, we are founded on building 100% sustainable developments. And we believe that net zero is the only way forward. Um, as Mr. Tantoko said, uh, we know that not one person or one company can bring a net zero world to reality. We need everyone to strive for this agenda and alliances like this will be instrumental to bringing net zero projects to scale. So when the opportunity came to join this alliance, we instantly said yes. 
Thank you, Miss Sam. And I think, Sir Carlos, you can jump on that point as well because construction company, I, I hate to say it, but one of the most unsustainable uh, industries. Painful, uh, no? Yeah. Of course. So, I mean, <laughs> how, are you, how are you going to shift that, specifically yeah. in the Philippines, diba? Well, well, when the chairman said no to coal, it, it uh, hit us right at the center because we did a lot of coal projects. So... Uh, the pain also opened their eyes to a new reality. And th that allowed us to pivot. And that pivot was very rewarding. It showed us a totally new spectrum of opportunities. So for us, joining the Alliance was a very natural thing to do. And it's the right thing to do. The world is on fire, as our chairman said. There's no time to waste. There's no excuse not to be part of this undertaking. Everyone, every single Filipino has to do a share. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of people to educate. And this alliance, at least from our end, at least from our industry, we hope to be at the forefront of at least bringing in more people so that they see that you all have to be part of this. The next 10 years, this is it. If we don't do anything in the next 10 years, I don't see a future. Okay, so 10 years or bust <laughs> now or wala na talaga. Sir Ed, you know, I yeah. what hit me in, in um, Rep Legarda's uh, keynote earlier on, was she said something about not being too consumeristic, right? She, she did mention that we need to change our consumption habits. And you, of course, as, a, as an FMCG, as a Unilever, how can you reconcile that uh, with, of course, this, this commitment to, to this uh, new... new uh, Face that you're entering in. Yeah, thanks, Anne. So yes, I agree. It's a you know very big commitment um, um, for us as well. No? Um, but I guess that's what we need, not to address a you know a very big complex issue like uh, like climate change. And on our part, I mean, Unilever has a long history of uh, advancing sustainable development no? by working with the civil society, by working with industry organizations, even working with our competitors. So actually, many of these companies face uh, you know similar issues that can be addressed only by collaboration, and that's why I'm, for Unilever we're really proud to be part of this alliance. No? We're we're ready to work with uh, with everybody with like-minded groups for uh, for climate action in the country. Thank you, Sir Ed. Ma'am, let's move on to Miss uh, Agnes De Jesus. You've been named one of the sustainability champions, specifically, you know. Governance 100 awardees. I mean, that's a, that's a big title here. But I want to ask your opinion on how you can convince businesses that it is their role to do something to stop our warming planet. I mean, there are even some debates that it's not even the Philippines' role because developing countries didn't cause this problem. It was the industrialized companies that are doing it. And then now, you know, it's, it's the governments that should be addressing this issue. It's not something that businesses should be, should be doing on a daily basis. How do you get more people to care uh, about this? I, I think for business, um, the reason for them is business continuity because climate change will damage their facilities, will affect their raw materials, will affect the productivity of their workers, even expose them to stringent regulations and even carbon taxes. And all of this add to the cost of doing business. And of course, we should recognize that business and industry started this. During the Industrial Revolution, the dumping of carbon emissions in the atmosphere was started by the sector. So we need to do our part. Okay, so we actually do have a role here to play because it's also our, our fault. Um, and, and, you know, th this is very important to keep in mind. It's, it's not uh, just something that, you know, I, I think uh, Sir, Sir Ricky mentioned, it's not something about, about compassion, but really it's, it's your responsibility. You need to take uh, responsibility for this. I want to ask uh, this uh, to the representative, of course, of FGD, Sir Benji. Is this even possible in the Philippines at this point in time with all of you know, the, the issues that we are facing in this country? Um, is it even possible to have you know, not, not just zero carbon, zero emissions day, but just the, the entire point of, of the Philippines being carbon neutral? Thanks, uh, Danny. It, it's not uh, only possible. I think it's uh, imperative for the Philippines to someday I guess achieve net zero uh, carbon. 
uh, because uh, I guess some of the speakers and uh, deputy speaker Senator Lauren uh, Ligarda also mentioned that I guess this is the only way forward. No, our our businesses, the industries will will not thrive if we don't uh, create a pathway where we can decarbonize our uh, operations and also achieve a circular economy. Okay, I think uh, Ms. Agnes also touched on uh, businesses and industries uh, started this, uh, uh, I guess, uh, the increase in the global warming. So I guess uh, businesses uh, should also be responsible to act on it uh, because they have the financial resources, they have the technological capabilities, and for some uh, of the partners here, they have uh, even global reach, and, and they have the innovative capacity to really find solutions. So I think if everyone will work together, uh, not just the businesses, but even for regular citizens, I think it's, it's possible for the Philippines and, and for the whole pl planet. Okay, so possible and imperative. So Ricky, let's go back to you. Of course, you know, we want everyone on board here, but a major concern with them even signing and being part of this alliance is is whether they can afford it. Uh, is it really, how expensive is it to actually decarbonize and implement these measures? And is there an economic, a real economic benefit that they can, you know, readily understand? Right. So for, for a lot of businesses, uh, Danny, you know, um, it's already economic now to replace some of the, the energy that they use with, with the renewable energy. Um, about 55% of the energy in the Philippines is produced from coal-fired power plants. And businesses can actually elect right, to buy their energy from clean energy sources at about the same cost. It doesn't have to be more expensive. And that's the beauty of it, right? Um, an investment in solar rooftops, an investment in, in, in buying. No, um, There's regulation already in, in our country that allows businesses that have a demand of 350,000 pesos or more per month to buy clean energy. And if businesses band together to create the demand side for clean energy, other businesses will create the supply side for clean energy. So I think it's possible and it's not necessarily going to hurt the bottom line okay sir can we just jump off on that point while we have you already and we want to hear it from you do we have enough renewable energy in the philippines for the entire country's power requirements there are a lot of energy security and energy equity problems still in the country can all businesses actually directly get power from renewable energy and if this isn't happening why isn't it happening yet yeah. i think um, to, to answer your question, I have to be very careful. I think all businesses, right, and particularly even um, uh, individuals who are disconnected from the grid, they can get their energy through solar solutions, right? So I used to be part of a foundation, um, so Solar Stiftung Energy, and we were able to connect close to half a million homes who never had power before and would burn kerosene inside their homes at 22 pesos per liter and then for a fraction of that cost less than a one peso would get the same amount of brightness uh, in, in homes in far-flung areas so for our type of grid where it's hard to reach everyone i think solar is part of the solution for businesses i think we can cut down the amount of uh, of power that we buy from coal by electing to buy clean energy and also by putting uh, solar panels when we can where we can Thank you, sir. And I think, Ms. Agnes, you would like to chime in and add to that. Yes, I'd like to share information on carbon dioxide removal technologies. Experts have actually inventoried 10 of them. It starts from being, there are those that are established, there are those that are speculative, there are those that cost $3 per ton, up to $600 per ton. But I think the solution being offered by the Alliance is, is very timely because it's one of the cheapest technologies listed around the world. As a matter of fact, out of the 10 technologies, only two are viable. The reforestation and afforestation and injection of carbon dioxide in oil reservoir. So here we have reforestation and afforestation being offered by the Alliance. It's cheap, 
it's not like the other technologies where you have to have capex, ah, capex and opex and chemical every year. But once you plant those trees, maintain it for three years, they grow on their own. It has also co-benefits of air quality, biodiversity, and land protection. So I think reforestation is key for okay. our problem. Thank you so much for that. I want to move on uh, to the signatories here of the Alliance. Um, let, let's kick off with Sir Harris. Sir Harris, uh, do you see you know, uh, the cost benefit uh, to be weighing to the benefits here? And have you actually looked in your own, uh, you said you're in a small company, whether investing in all of these things would have a benefit economically? Yeah, we uh, we understand that, and uh, as a sustainability communications agency, we really uh, we really understand that being sustainable makes a lot of business sense. No, uh, for Jake, uh, as I mentioned, we're a small company, but uh, we have uh, policies in place already to be sustainable. So we have a very small office there in Ortigas, uh, uh, compared with some of you. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have uh, we have different projects already and policies in place to commit to sustainability. And we're also working from home. I think that helps also in uh, mitigating our, uh, our 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 carbon emission. Thank you for that. I think, um, Miss uh, Jane of Siliman, how can you convince uh, you know the, the this sector to invest in it from an economic perspective, saying that this will actually benefit uh, you know the costs of the university and the sector in particular. Well, here at Siliman, we have a combination of um, renewable energy. Part of our energy utilization comes from solar and part also from um, geothermal. We did the math. Um, we had a computation, com uh, computing, getting our energy from our usual cooperative and from um, getting it from a geothermal. We saw some savings. But more importantly, it is the quality of life that we give to our students on campus. They see that we walk the talk, we see that it's green, and the savings from, from our energy will also is also passed down to our students. So economically, it has benefited the university as far as energy use is concerned. Good to know, ma'am. I'd like to throw the same question uh, to the real estate sector and constructor construction sector. Uh, Ms. Sam, you are, of course, you know, a listed company. Investors are looking. It's fiduciary duty also to use their money for in the right ways. We can't just, you know, be tree huggers here, even if we really wanted to. Uh, how have you calculated these these risks, um, you know, on the downside? And, and how have you convinced your investors that this is a worthy investment for them. Correct. Um, um, okay, actually, in, in the economic side, Arthaland is a very good example for, for that because we've built our business 100% um, sustainable. And as you can see, Arthaland is really there in the market. So um, that's why what, what we always say is that um, sustainability makes good business sense. The capital expense is or more in the um, upfront, but you'll always get it back through your operations. And for properties like like Arthaland, who who operates our own buildings, you'll definitely get it back. And actually, as Mr. Gonzalez would say, our one of our our founder, um, he would also like to to tell our different businesses that um, sustainability is all, all about mindset. It's not about it's not cost. It's actually an investment because you'll mm -hmm. definitely get it back. If not now, then in the future. Thanks, Ms. Sam. So it's an investment. Uh, and Sir Carlos, you you are ready to make this this investment. But how ready are you to convince your investors that this is a good investment? Do you even have you know a time frame on this? Are you able to calculate uh, with, with some data already the, the benefits of this compared to to not doing it? I guess the economics are very straightforward for us. Um, decarbonization equals efficient, being more efficient. And when you start digging deeper into what that means in your operations, you will recoup all the savings because of your efforts towards decarbonization. A very simple example that we experimented with is installing a solar rooftop 
about three or four years ago. And it's been very, very uh, rewarding for us. Of course, the question now is how do we expand it? But when you start applying the same principles in terms of your fundamental operation, decarbonization will tell you it makes a lot of sense. It's just very simple economics. You will gain as you become more efficient. Thank you. Sir, Sir Ed Sunik of Unilever, can, can you give some examples here of what, what specifically have you done to take these steps and whether you've been able to you know, measure, measure the impact, not just from an environmental perspective, but from an economic perspective? I anyway, I uh, wanted to to also ask uh, Sir Benji here of SGV if it is such a good idea, and if if everybody here is saying that the cost benefits are are obvious, why aren't more companies, you know, ready to sign, and why aren't more companies just raging to to do this? That's a that's a good question. Why aren't uh, a lot of companies racing to this uh, net zero carbon target? Well, the, the simple answer to that, uh, Danny, and to everyone is, of course, this is this is a journey. Uh, we, we have to acknowledge that uh, different companies would have different starting points. Uh, they have, uh, of course, different uh, priorities right now, uh, given uh, the, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I think some of them are still in the stage of uh, recovering their businesses. But... Uh, what is clear is the direction is everyone will have to go to net zero carbon. Uh, it's just a matter of time and I guess facing for, for the different companies, depending on their capabilities and capacities right now. Okay, so the intention is there. The timing is a little bit tricky uh, at the moment, but there's no more debate on, on this uh, particular issue. Sir Ed, I wanted to throw you the same question that I did uh, with, with Sir Carlos and Spam here, specifically for Unilever. Could you give us some examples as to whether you've been able to implement certain steps uh, right. to, to zero carbon uh, or to carbon neutrality rather, and whether this has already translated into not just environmental impact, but also economic benefits? Yeah, sorry, I had a problem with my mic a while ago. Um, yeah, but to answer the question, um, first we were... We try to eliminate the emissions from our own operations no? and you know working through our entire value chain we also try to reduce the emissions of our suppliers and our partners and we've also integrated the climate action into our brands because we're an fmcg and uh, we basically operate to our brands and you know to our brands and to our brand innovation uh, we try to integrate our climate action plan there as well and of course, influencing the bigger society is also very important no? through partnerships and, and advocacy. So I have to say that, you know, we've already shifted all our factory sites to 100% renewable grid electricity through partnerships like uh, First Gen. And now we're trying to extend this setup even to our third party controlled warehouses in our cold storage depots. And what we're also trying to do is for landing, you know, various local climate action initiatives, including plant-based food transformation, and also transforming the um, freezers that we have. No? Um, as you know, Selecta is the, you know, the biggest ice cream brand in the country, and therefore, it's very critical that we transform all our freezers to green freezers, no? non-HFC point uh, type of freezers. And, and lastly, we have a massive collection program no? through our uh, collect, kito, uh, collect Kilo Kita activities. No? Um, plastic collection program in hundreds of barangays across the country. So these are just some of the things that we're doing, which is really translating to a viable and sustainable business for the company as we speak. Thank you so much. Those are great uh, concrete developments there from the Unilever side. Sir, let's throw back to uh, Sir Ricky Tantoko here. We have some questions coming in from our audience now, and I'll start taking them. This one from Augusto Caesar Esmeralda of Resilient.ph. Very specific question. How do we join the alliance, and what does it take to be a member? Can you give specific steps uh, on, on who is qualified to do this, You know what that entails in terms of costs, um, what the benefits are, etc.? Yeah, so thank you for, uh, for the question, no? You can actually um, join us by, uh, you know, clicking through the EDC website or the the Net Zero Carbon Alliance uh, that we have here. We have the logo uh, shown, no? and um, and then uh, begin to exchange information. 
what we are looking for are, are entities that are prepared to commit uh, to change uh, their ways, you know, and the way they, they consume energy, the way they recycle. I mean, any of those um, areas that, uh, for example, Unilever mentioned are, are worth noting, and then we welcome uh, like-minded um, institutions to join us. You know, around the world, Danny, there are organizations that exist that are like this. One of them that we've been following for some time is, is uh, the RE100, 100 of the largest uh, corporations in the world banded together to actually commit to bring their entire supply chain, their entire production uh, to zero emissions and 100% RE. And these include large companies like Nike, uh, banks like Goldman Sachs, uh, auto manufacturers like BMW, um, retailers like Walmart. So th these are huge companies that have an impact on the entire value chain. And they are proving that it can be done in a manner that will not hurt their business, but rather allow their business to thrive. And we are starting that now, here today, for the Philippines. Thank you so much for that. And just, you know, for our audience here, you can actually see the email specifically uh, on your screens here if you are interested to join. That is corpcom, C-O-R-P-C-O-M-M, -M, at energy.com.ph. So thank you for that. They can just send an email um, and you will have more information on that. Now, I do have a couple of questions from the floor here. Um, this was, of course, for Deputy Speaker Legarda from Jacob Olano. I'll just read it out here. The most effective way to ensure clean energy in our country is through the utilization of national government mechanisms. But we must also recognize the important steps made by the private sector. How can we be certain that corporations would prioritize the advocacy for clean energy over profit-driven motives? That's a very strong question here. How can we make sure that decision-making processes concerning environmental and energy issues will not go to the hands of the few? And how can we create mechanisms to promote stakeholder participation? And we already have an answer uh, on behalf of DS Legarda, which was copy-pasted to the chat. And I will just read this out for the rest of our panelists here. They say convergence is going to be part of the mechanism. Energy transition in the context of just transition under the NDC would be pursued using whole of government and society approach. The private sector would be consulted on the process of just transition, including the provision of support that it needs. But this is a very interesting question that I think I would like to throw as well to Ms. Agnes. How can we be certain that you know corporations will prioritize this? over profit driven motives i mean it's it's very you know as already mentioned by our other panelists it should come hand in hand it shouldn't be one or the other but for many other people it's still one or the other right? how, how can you make sure that they they you know understand the same line of thinking that you are doing the more important mechanism in different territories is to price carbon or in the form of carbon taxes the other one is to for government to have enabling mechanisms or policies and programs that will incentivize every green product or every green service of business. So it's a balance. Thank Tax you. Incentives. Okay, so incentives here, but they also mentioned from uh, DS Legarda a lot as policy driven as well. Sir Benji, can you comment on that? You know, given that uh, the policies are are in place, but she mentioned as well in her speech, we need more effective implementation of of the laws that do exist. Uh, and in the meantime, you're trying to convince corporations and companies to get on with it uh, without the, the, the incentives being really there. You know, uh, in a implemented how can you do this yeah that, that's correct uh, danny so uh, businesses and organizations need not to for regulations uh, in fact uh, some of the top companies have uh, voluntarily reported on their sustainability initiatives their plans to decarbonize uh, how to promote their uh, i guess circular economy and uh, uh, they have all documented this in their sustainability reports, uh, which they made, which they make public. And for many of these organizations, they have been cured uh, or verified by an uh, inter-independent uh, verifier. And I guess uh, with that process, it adds uh, confidence and credibility that 
all this information, all this uh, initiative uh, disclosed by organizations are in fact uh, validated. So I guess that's one way to, uh, I guess, promote the implementation of uh, a sustainability activity. Okay, thank you so much. Now, I have a question for all of the panelists. This one is from Jose Aldon. The two biggest carbon emitters are oil and coal users. In fact, for our country last year, we consumed 81% of our primary fuel using these two fuel types. The key issue is how do you incentivize consumers to terminate or minimize or convert to clean energy in an affordable manner? Any recommendation, recommended termination and our financing strategies from the speakers or panelists. I think we got something like 7,000 megawatts of coal plants and millions and millions of old ICE, internal combustion engine vehicles on the road. Of course, the government has to back this up by putting realistic and doable energy policies or incentives. This is gr a good question. I mean, how what can consumers do? Harris, you, you have a communications company on sustainability. How can you change uh, the habits of people? Are we supposed to just not use our cars? Are are we supposed to just, you know, not yeah. buy from from products that that are using coal? I mean, how, how do we yeah. act? Good thing consumers are already demanding from these corporations to be sustainable. I think it's very important for uh, for us, really, as a communications agency, to engage the public about this topic, to educate them first, uh, and engage them uh, with the discussion and uh, uh, use different creative methods to make sure that they understand. Uh, the, they understand the value of uh, supporting sustainable products and sustainable services as well as uh, uh, so because if they understand, they're going to support it. No? Uh, yeah. And uh, it's important to really create a culture of change. And that can be only achieved if, uh, if people understand the value of uh, being carbon neutral. Okay, so it's all about mindset here. It's it's not really about availability of the products, but really a shift in, in mindset. Miss Jane, are you seeing this mindset set shift uh, in our young, in our youth, in in the types of students? Are they the ones pushing for this? Yes. Is it a bottom up approach? Yes, they're the ones pushing for this. As a matter of fact, even our um, students from the school of basic education and high school college you know these students are very aware and they know that it is their generation who will bear the brunt of um, this climate climate change um, crisis so we are really trying to promote lifestyle and behavioral and consumption changes in the way we consume um, products and services so we try to you know advocate for change with students as early as elementary and high school and they are very open and very concerned about this because they know that their future is at stake thank you for that i wish everybody had uh, the same mentality <laughs> it doesn't seem to be the case for the older generations they don't really uh, you know apart from the ones here miss sam can you tell behavior. Us, behavior. Ms. sam can you tell us about you know your strategies as artha land on on how real estate can can also be a pioneer in, in changing the behavioral habits of consumers so, um, you know, as a real estate developer, we are one of the biggest consumers in energy. And if um, it is the responsibility of the developer to choose what kind of um, energy are we sourcing. So, um, and because it also affects our tenants as well as our residents inside, right? So, their carbon footprint would be equal to whatever energy that we are, we are putting in, in our buildings. So, in our... Um, for us, what we do is that we partner with ABC or First Gen so that we could get renewable energy for our buildings. And with just that strategy, we are able to influence the energy consumption and carbon footprint of all our stakeholders, our tenants and residents. So from Thank you for that. So, mm -hmm. so it's a bigger stakeholder uh, approach here that you want them to understand you know what they're getting into sir carlos can you add to that uh in terms of changing consumption behavior you've you've been in the company you know for a long time you've been in the industry of, of construction for a long time how do you convince people uh that you know their habits need to change that we cannot stick to the same tried and tested ways and there must be not just a disruption but a massive overhaul uh, of the sector i think we start with with uh, making sure people understand that 
they all have a part to play that they can contribute no matter how small. You begin with that premise and you will see that there will be a momentum that grows. You know, we, we launched this program in our company called Zero Hero. And all we wanted our people to do was avoid that one plastic straw. You know, start avoiding those those uh, uh, ways of, of behaviors at home. And, and you see that it's so easy for people to just follow. And you get so many followers very quickly, especially for the young. And the young, you know how adept they are with social media. So it's very easy for them to propagate this idea. So it, it was like a no-brainer for them. In fact, I think uh, the other side of the equation, and, and pardon my my counterintuitive suggestion, but consume less power. When you start consuming less power, then there will be less demand for for power that may be sourced from, I guess, for today, uh, uh, fuel coming from uh, coal and fossil fuel. But, you know, consume less power. It's the same principle. Just reduce one kilowatt a day. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, Noel's, uh, Joseph, th this is, you know, manufacturing industry for you guys. Uh, how do you consume less power uh, in this in this scenario? And how do you make sure that people understand that you need to be shifting uh, energy sources? Yeah, well, so, you know, it's, uh, it's really more of customers for us. Uh, customers are driving change and they're requiring many of the companies to be environmentally responsible and so this kind of takes us through the whole pipeline of customers requiring us and we require our suppliers as well so i think that's a good influence it's a good motivation because in the end it's it's really business continuity and uh, that's on top of being environmentally responsible Okay, I think uh, you can uh, add to this with a question from Ms. Geraldine Apostol. How do we know, I'm not sure uh, what she meant by this, but how do we know if the disposal, I think, of machines, equipment, appliances that are not environmentally friendly, how do we make sure that we, we assure your customers that these things are being done in a sustainable manner? Um, well, so um, there are many waste disposal strategies, obviously. Uh, the main thing for me and, and, and for us is that we have to review our all, you know, all our processes and in terms of, you know, how we meet and review our carbon footprint and looking at this and including the disposal processes, if we're able to interpret and review it and find a way to, you know, uh, dispose them in a more responsible way, I think we should go through that option and those processes. Okay, thank you so much. And Sir Joseph, I just want, uh, so, sorry, uh, Sir, Sir Ed, rather, uh, of Unilever, I wanted to understand your opinion on whether what our other panelists are saying that the youth are coming into the play here, they're the ones bottom up asking for these types of products. Is that the same in the Philippines? I mean, do you really have a shift in the habits of Filipinos that is very consumption driven, quite short term, uh, you know, in, in many ways. Uh, is there a major long term shift in the generations that are really asking for more sustainable products, packaging, logistics, you know, uh, even in the ways that you develop your products? Yeah, so I think that's right. Huh? So our consumers are actually demanding already that we do the right thing when it comes to our environmental impact. As a matter of fact, we have um, you know a list of our sustainable brands um, in Unilever, and if you check the way the sustainable brands is, um, you know, are performing, it's actually growing faster than uh, you know, the rest of the brands that have not yet uh, probably established their impact in terms of uh, you know the social environmental in, environmental issue that the brand can address. So definitely, the consumers are uh, you know are, are demanding it. Now, it's also important to understand you know that two thirds of uh, our our uh, our carbon footprint are coming from the consumers use of our products yeah so the bulk of the impact that we have actually comes from the consumers behavior and therefore it's really important that we try to influence this you not know, through our communication for advocacy and our brand innovation to make sure that they're part of the um, solution uh, towards net zero Thank you so much for that. I have a very interesting question here that we didn't get to touch upon just yet for Miss Jane. This is from DSC Contegino. 
how can we integrate the concept of carbon neutrality in the curriculum to inform the youth yeah. of the negative impacts of burning coal and importance of it, looking for alternative energy sources? Does this even exist already, right? Yeah. Is this part of the academic curriculum in any shape or form? Yeah. Um, as you know, um, I said earlier that environmental sustainability is part of the vision, mission, and goals of the university. So we have here um, general education subjects that are required for senior high school, for instance, mm -hmm. or even in tertiary. And it is in these general education subjects that we really, and we talk about earth science, um, biology, chemistry, and physics. We always integrate um, the concept of carbon neutrality, environmental conservation, um, trees and plants and, and, and um, even now there's an issue that um, we really want to put in the forefront of all our students. So we talk about this on campus and our student government, we have a very, very active um, environment advocacy group who really takes the discussion in, in, to our students. In, they promote environmental sustainability activities in our students um, through organizations on campus. So environmental sustainability is something that our students are already very familiar with. And you're right, they are really the ones that push the adults to do something about how to make the campus greener. Very so, interesting. They should be the ones lecturing instead of uh, being lectured. It's, it's not just um, one subject and in one, one semester. It's actually weaved through a series of um, subjects from grade one. No, no, from, yeah, from grade one until um, college. And it's a very iterative um, yeah. process. Good to know, ma'am. And I hope that that does get continued uh, implementation, of course, and support from the government side. Ms. Agnes, you wanted to add something on the non-environmental friendly disposal, specifically for manufacturing products. Yes, I think it's high time, and I think they're doing it to look into circularity, the recycling, the reuse, and the extending of the life of the parts. But more importantly, it should start with the design of the product, where you look for low-carbon materials and make sure that they're designed so that they can be recyclable when they're ready to be disposed. Thank you, ma'am. And just to close, we don't have much time here. Uh, Sir Ricky, I know that you know, you're know you not necessarily on the government side, you're from the private sector, but there is a question here from uh, Ms. Dulce Blanca Punzalan from the UN Global Compact. And I think you uh, can answer this perhaps with Benji as well. Please comment on the following. Implementation of aspirational target of at least 15,000 megawatts additional renewable energy capacity by 2030. Is this what, what is the status here? Uh, to what extent can that be achieved in, in less than 10 years? Second, at least 10,000 megawatts additional renew, uh, renewable capacity by 2040. In addition to that, 1,200 megawatts from other emerging technologies by 2040. 10% increase in penetration rate of electric vehicles for road transport by 2040. Increase in aggregate natural gas consumption from the transport, commercial, and industry sectors between 2018 and 2040. And finally, 5% aggregate energy savings from petroleum and electricity by 2040. I think it's just a question of, uh, are we there? Uh, are these targets achievable? Should we be revisiting this? Uh, and in what ways do, do you believe we're, we're on the right path? Um, great question to uh, to end the morning with. No, I think the targets are achievable, but clearly there has to be management of policy on the side of government. So, for example, I'm not sure our audience is aware of this, but during one of the create bills that passed, um, not this recent one, but one behind, I believe that they put a provision that electric vehicles vehicles can come into the country without uh, being taxed, without excise taxes, right? unlike other types of vehicles that receive 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 100% tax. So we need to continue to put the policies in place. Mm -hmm. Those of us in business and civil society have to ask for those policies to happen. So for example, government says no more coal, period, no permits, nothing. Then you will see that there are no other options but to put up other facilities that emit less carbon overall versus uh, the alternatives. So 
policy has a lot to to do with it. And I think if if we listen to to what's what's happening all over the world, capital is shifting, policies are shifting. Um, I think we have no other no 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 other place but to head there. My my only and no my only wish really is that we we get there as a leader rather than a follower. And the reason I wish that is because there are three or four major asymmetries when we talk about climate change, right? One of them is the asymmetry of information. Not a lot of people know that what they are doing causes impact to the environment. So for example, every time you click yes to buy a cotton t-shirt, you are saying yes basically to about 90 or 100 pounds of pesticides and 2,700 liters of fresh water being used, right? People need to, 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 to bring the facts out. That's the first asymmetry. The other major asymmetry that I think we need to, to, to consider is the asymmetry between the impact on those that cause climate change and those that get hit by climate change, right? Mm -hmm. Businesses will be able to rebound. Government will be able to rebound. But can you imagine the farmers and those that do not have the wherewithal to withstand the damage, right? In, in a couple of years back, there were three typhoons in a span of 18 days. And the damage to the Bicol region was 76 billion pesos. Can you imagine the number of kids that had to stop going to school just so that they could rebuild their roof, right, for that time? So, so we need to work together to end climate injustice, right? And then the other asymmetry that I just wanted to mention is the asymmetry of time. The impacts of climate change are going to worsen and accelerate over the next 30, 40, 50 years if we don't do anything. But the behaviors that need to change have to happen now, right? Because if we, we prevent more carbon from spewing out into the atmosphere, then we have a brighter future ahead. If we don't, then the recurring impacts will get worse and worse over time and will accelerate what I call climate injustice. So we, we I think those in this alliance, have to think about the asymmetries that exist and because those asymmetries exist, we need to act. Now, Aristotle calls it pockets of excellence. We don't have to change the entire planet, but where we can, we should create those positive changes. Focus on creating pockets of excellence. Excellent point and mandate here because these are things that can be done right now. The Bajas just uh, tackle those asymmetries, particularly the information asymmetry that can easily be, be done by better reporting and, and uh, sustainability reporting standards here. I think, uh, Sir Benji, you wanted to add to that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Danny. So this will just be very short. Uh, Nikki kind of alluded about the shifting uh, patterns of capital. So my encouragement is for organizations to take advantage of uh, sustainable finance. So I think our government through the uh, Green Force have really uh, started uh, paving the way for sustainable finance in the country. And, and many of the organizations in the Philippines have successfully uh, issued green bonds, uh, different sustainability linked bonds. And uh, most of it uh, were, were oversubscribed. So, so there is a lot of capital, there is a lot of money uh, the organizations can take advantage uh, related to uh, greening the, the investments and helping achieve uh, net zero sooner. Excellent point. I don't think you know, we touched upon that enough, but that's uh, for another webinar in terms of financing uh, this. If you have the, the financiers, the banks unwilling to fund coal and more willing to fund renewable energy projects, then the world would be a much better and more forward place. So absolutely great point there. So thank you guys for all of your insights. And just to close, I wanted to do a very quick round. Um, you're here because you signed something you've signed a pledge uh, can you give you know a one minute or statement on what you uh specifically pledge to do from your companies and um as you move forward uh into this uh, alliance uh let's kick off with sir harris um uh, well i learned a lot this morning so i think a uh, partnership is important and uh, that's actually uh sdg number 17 and, and since we're in the business of sustainability communications and we discuss already the value of re-engaging our customers 
engaging and educating almost everyone about climate change and about the importance of uh, being net zero carbon. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, and it's also part of our vision. So therefore, uh, we really need to uh, partner. It's it's very clear right now that we really need we really need a strength, no, to partner with different corporations and educate them, uh, and even startups and smaller businesses and their consumers as well. Uh, we really need to ed- to start the education process, uh, informing mm-hmm. them about uh, these things and how they can act on it, or act on uh, different uh, uh, different uh, issues no, related to climate change. Thank you. So pledge on educating people better there. Ms. Jane, how, how about you? Well, the university commits to model a sustainable campus to our students. And hopefully when they graduate, they can as well model, model this in their lives and in the businesses where they will be. Very uh, clear statement there. Inculcate that uh, in our students there uh, and pave the way for the rest to follow. Thank you so much, Ms. Sam. Um, Ortholand is committed to a net zero development portfolio by 2030. Actually, Ortholand Century Pacific Tower, our flagship office development in BGC, is a certified net zero project. Our tenants are already enjoying a decarbonized operation, allowing them to make a meaningful contribution to net zero agenda. As my final message, I would like to iterate that this achievement is proof to the built industry that net zero projects can be done. And we hope that our project can serve as an encouragement for more projects in the immediate future. Thank you, Ms. Sam. We'll hold you to that and do another webinar on 2030, whether you've achieved that. Carlos, can you say the same? Yeah, I think, you know, being partners with EDC, not only because they're our sister companies, has really taught us a lot of things, a different, totally different perspective on how to conduct business, but more in terms of what um, decarbonization truly is. Uh, there are just too many opportunities we've missed out uh, as companies, and we know we got to do something today. Uh, whether it's simply informing others, whether it is uh, enjoining others to, to understand climate change better. And as Ricky pointed out, you know, Pity the people who don't have the resources when they get hit by those typhoons. So we got to do something today. And and as a company, we'd like to spearhead that in our own, very own industry. Thank you. So commitment to act with urgency uh, is your main commitment, Sir Ed. Yeah, so we are definitely committed not to reduce our emissions to zero within our operations by 2030. Um, yeah, and, and thank you for the opportunity to work on our our climate transition action plan no, through this alliance. No? As, as, a, as Cardo said a while ago, this is this, this is a decisive decade for all of us, mm-hmm. and we really need to act fast no, through industry partnerships such as this and public policy uh, advocacy. And you know, we hope that you know, by being more transparent and by being more accountable, we can get more awareness and more dialogue and encourage more companies not to basically to follow suit and, and, and join the race to net zero. Thank you. So transparency and accountability are what you are pledging today. And finally, Joseph, to close. Yeah. Um, so we have started with this journey uh, when we started in Cebu in 2012. We partnered with EDC, and we have started measuring our carbon footprint two years ago. Uh, we have developed a strong roadmap towards li- uh, climate neutrality and we are committed to execute them and to influence our partners, our suppliers, our stakeholders to do the same. So that's that's our commitment. Thank you so much. And we will hold everyone to that. Uh, we have that all um, taped here. We also have that all with our audience. You know, you're accountable to the audience that have been watching today. So thank you so much, everyone, for these valuable and important insights. Hopefully, you will just be this will just be the first uh, of the conversations that need to be had and the first of the accountability discussions that need to be had in the future. So great uh, having all of your insights today. And for everyone else, if you do have more 
more questions, you could send them to corpcom, that's C-O-R-P-C-O-M-M, at energy.com.ph. I've been very, very honored to be hosting uh, this webinar today. And as this webinar comes to an end, I would, of course, like to thank our partner organizations for all of their support. So thank you to the Association of Young Environmental Journalists, the Asia Society Philippines, the British Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the Management Association of the Philippines, the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Pamantasa ng Lungsod ng Maynila, CHAS SC, the Philippine Normal University, Excel Society, the University of Asia and the Pacific, and the University of the Philippines Economics Society. We would also like to thank our media partner, Business World. And to all of you watching, do not fret. You can still share this with your family and friends. So please let more people know about this initiative, sharing the link. Of course, you can also let us know what your thoughts are on the topic. Tag social media at the Philippine Star, at Philippine Star. Again, thank you so much for joining us in today's webinar. My name is Danny Laurel, your host, and this has been The Day We Go Zero. Enjoy the rest of your day. In 1998, I remember starting my political career as a freshman senator in the 11th Congress of the Philippines. I was ranked first, garnering over half the total votes, the youngest senator, and one of only two women senators that time. Perhaps a very green senator, but I wasn't hurled accidentally into the position. I certainly worked hard for it. I was anxious at the same time, very excited to do the work I believe I was born to do. And I've always been deeply motivated. I want to be a public servant leader who will strive to do relevant and meaningful work. And so even then, I've always been focused on certain issues that I'm passionate about. I was chairperson for committees on environment and economic affairs. Before I turned 40, I found myself being named as one of the global leaders for tomorrow in the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Then, the United Nations Environment Program Award in Turin, Italy in 2001. All the while offering legislation benefiting women and children's rights, including the Anti-Domestic Violence Act, Anti-Child Labor Law, the Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act, I also sponsored into law the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act and most of the environmental laws. And by 2001, I was voted Senate Majority Floor Leader, the first and only woman to occupy such post. I continued my work as legislator and ran another term, and I was once again proclaimed number one senator in the 2007 senatorial elections, garnering the most number of votes and holding the distinction of being the only woman senator to top the Senate race twice. More work, more laws, more advocacies. And in this 14th Congress, I was again chairperson of the following committees. But as the expression goes, there is no rest for the weary. For the next 12 years, I continue the work as senator in the 15th, 16th and 17th Congresses of the Philippines, still advancing my passion and advocacies and chairing the committees on climate change, foreign relations, finance, and even cultural communities. I'm extremely proud of the tangible achievements that I've made as Senator. But beyond the laws and the bills, I've managed to tirelessly work on my advocacies. In 2009, we passed into law the landmark Philippine Climate Change Act, of which I was principal author and sponsor. In June that same year, I delivered the keynote speech at the Forum on the Human Impact of Climate Change in Geneva, reiterating the need for a new brand of politics and governance to address the growing climate disaster risks. And there I introduced the Legarda Doctrine, a new development thinking and a more holistic development philosophy founded on sustainable and equitable socio-economic ecosystems and governance. By December of the same year, I also spoke 
on climate change legislation at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen, Denmark, calling on parliamentarians to initiate legislation to address climate change issues. I've also been a longtime advocate of preserving our national identity and culture and the ancestry of indigenous peoples. I've been bestowed the following titles by various indigenous peoples groups. I was also the prime architect and main driving force behind the country's return to the prestigious Venice Biennale, the Olympics of the contemporary art world, all after 51 years of absence. Amidst all these, I continue my work and dedication to public service. My cup overflows, and I'm equally humbled and overwhelmed. I'm immensely grateful to all those who have helped me through these years. I remember the faces of people who acknowledged me, trusted me, gave me full support. I will be forever thankful. But more than all the chairmanships that I have led, more than the laws and the bills that I have helped legislate, and even more important than the recognition, the accolades and the awards, I am extremely proud of the people I've been able to help, the children, the women, the families and communities, the indigenous peoples, the farmers, fisher folks, the so-called last, least, and the lost. I am inspired by them. I am motivated, encouraged, and moved by them. And I continue to have them in my mind and in my heart as I proceed with my life work as public servant leader. I am yours humbly, Lauren Legarda.